little bit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, the brothers asked me to share concerning, first, my own personal experience in coming into the Lord's recovery, and also uh, something of a history of the Lord's recovery since, especially in this country, uh, since I have been here uh, almost all of that time. It's been a wonderful time. Praise the Lord. Well, I think we realize that uh, the Lord's recovery actually began with Martin Luther. <laughs> but I, actually, really, it began with the Apostle Paul and, and John because of the church was already degrading when they wrote, when John wrote his gospel and his epistles, the church was already degrading. So we have to see the recovery goes all the way back to them. And uh, then the Apostle Paul's later books, his prison epistles, no doubt, especially the ones to Timothy, Amen. Titus, and Philemon, the church was also degraded, so degraded that Asia had left him. Right. Can you imagine? That means all the churches in Asia had turned their back on the Apostle Paul. That's hard to believe in his lifetime. So, uh, no doubt, recovery was trying to come in. At least recovery books were written, put it that way. But the church continued to degrade and to degrade and to degrade, of course, until it became the Roman Catholic Church. And you come into the period of the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages, somewhere from the 5th century to the 15th century, right in that area. And then, of course, Martin Luther was raised up. Amen. And the real recovery then began with him uh, to recover, basically, justification by faith. That you don't need all the Roman Catholic things. You just need to believe. Amen. Have faith in Jesus Christ. I think we know this. Then after, of course, Martin Luther, you have uh, probably... What, Zinzendorf before the Brethren, or the Brethren first? No, Zinzendorf. Zinzendorf was next with the Moravian Brethren. Right. Zinzendorf, and then after him, of course, the Brethren recovered all the basic teachings of the Bible. And then after them, you have some of the inner life being recovered by so many others. Of course, the inner life was even back with some with Madame Guyon in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But all of these things were all working together. All of these different ones, we don't have the time to mention them all. But once Martin Luther started, you have Zinzendorf, you have the brethren recovering the basic teachings with the types in the Old Testament. Then you have the inner life people, such as uh, uh, Madame Guion, and then, of course, you had Jesse Penn Lewis, later on even in this century, uh, Austin Sparks. All of these ones were used by the Lord to recover certain aspects of the truth of the Lord's New Testament economy. Then, though the real one that put everything together, I think we all realized, was Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee had a photographic memory. This was told to us. I never heard Brother Lee say too much about this, but uh, Brother Samuel Chang always told us about this, that he could just read a book, you know, and just, just turn the page like this. And, of course, you have heard Brother Lee tell the story about how uh, his room was filled with books. I mean, many of us have. You come into his room, it's just stacked, stacked with books all around. And actually what Watchman Nee did was to take the cream of all the writings from all the Christians from the first century up to then which is up to the 1920s in there. He had everything, and he read everything. He read it all. Brother Lee said he didn't have to read it because Brother Nee read it and passed it on. Amen. He read everything, and he took the best, that which was the scriptural truth. Everything that was of truth and of the scriptures, they took. And so, the Lord's recovery with Watchman Nee began in 1922 when he started his first meeting. But uh, because of some of the ones that were meeting with him, uh, eventually it didn't work out so well. 
In fact, they excommunicated him, I think is how it ended up. So he started again in 1928. And this one is the one uh, in Shanghai that continued. This one continued. And of course, Brother Lee met him in June of 1933. So it had been going about five years. But of course, even before Watchman Nee started his first meeting in 1928, he was putting out writings, his magazine called The Christian, and other writings. Uh, Brother Lee had read his writings before he ever met him. So these two came together. I'm just making it brief. I think we're all familiar. But these two came together in 1933, and that's when Brother Lee, after a short period of time, became clear that there could not be two flows. Mm -hmm. That there is just one ministry, one flow, one testimony, one body, one move. Mm -hmm. One. (laughs) One recovery. So, Brother Lee had asked him to come there. To move there. So he did. So I think we're all familiar with this story. And of course, it was through Watchman Nee then that he recovered all the basic truths. Or I should put it this way. He took all the basic truths from the top of the Christian writings from the first century up till then. Plus the matter, of course, he received much help from Miss Emmy Barber who was there in the outskirts of Shanghai, very much help in the matter of the inner life. So, through all of this truth, plus his own experience, through uh, the inner life that he received much help, then Watchman Nee began to see more and more. Not just what he had, uh, you could say, taken from all of these books, but then through this, plus his experience of life, He began to see more and more in the Word until, you see, until, I believe it was in 1938, he gave the first conference, which were the messages concerning our mission, which was translated into the normal Christian church life. But it was entitled at that time, Concerning Our Mission. After he gave it in Chinese, then he rewrote it himself in English. And that was the book. This was not a translation. The book Concerning Our Mission was written in English by Watchman Nee after it was given in Chinese. And then that is, of course, almost word for word what we have now in our latest edition of the Normal Christian Church Life. So, at that time, of course, then, there needed to be a container for all of this. All of these truths, all of the recovered truths of the Bible concerning Christ and the church, yet there was no container. What was needed was the basic ground of the church. What is the basis? What is the ground? What is the standing of the church? And of course, we've all read that book, and we know it was at that time he became clear from the Word, very clear. You can't argue. (laughs) From the Word, there is only one church in one city. Not because we like to have a doctrine of one church, one city. Some have tried that. Not because we like to have a doctrine, but because there is one body. Because of the oneness. One church, one city does not come out of somebody's idea of a doctrine. It comes out from the fact that there is only one body. Mm -hmm. And in order to keep the oneness of the one body, there can only be one expression of that one body in each geographical area. It makes sense. So in the Scriptures, it is clear there's only one church in one city. The church in Jerusalem, the church in Antioch, the church in Corinth, the church in Ephesus, on and on and on. And, of course, there were some church meeting in the homes. We know this. Of course, we know every all the verses. But all of those churches meeting in the homes were churches that were standing for the lampstand in that city. Every one of them, we can prove it scripturally. And if you want to have all the verses, you can take Brother Nee's book, The Normal Christian Church Life, or further talks on the church life, or Brother Lee's book, which is 
uh, clear, you might say, the practical expression of the church. And all the verses are there to show clearly uh, all the mentions to churches meeting in the homes are actually churches meeting in a city. Mainly it was Rome, I believe, Ephesus, uh, Colossae. Anyway, they became clear at this time that there was a real ground for the oneness of the body in the practical meeting of the church life. This was in 1938. Okay, then they began to further the Lord's recovery in China. From 1938 on, of course, Brother Nee began to see more and more and more, as Brother Lee said. It was in 1938, of course, that he visited England. Watch him, they visited England, and he gave several messages there at Honor Oak, of which were translated into the normal Christian life, sit, walk, stand, and what shall this man do? All of those messages were given in England and translated by Angus Kinnear, Austin Sparks' son-in-law. Uh, into just from longhand notes in 1938 and later on were published quite a number of years later. Actually, almost 20 years later. Excuse me. I believe that's right, though. He did finish England in 1938. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah, that's right. Okay. Then, uh, of course, as they got into the 1940s, the war came. And, of course, uh, Japan invaded uh, Manchuria. And, uh, of course, then the Chinese were fully involved with the war. So there was not too much going on except in Chifu, where Brother Lee was by this time. He had left Shanghai, and the work had sent him back to the north China, where he was working there in the church in Chifu. But it was hard to do too much. But we know at that time there was a practical practice of the church life. Brother Ni was unable to get it worked out that fully in Shanghai. But the real model of the practical church life uh, got worked out in Chifu. We know this up until, of course, 1948. Then the communists began to come down from the north. Brother Ni had to leave Chifu because he was listed by the communists as a criminal. And they were the first, he was one of the first ones they wanted in the whole north. So he left. Right after he left, the communists were at the door, knocking, wanting him. And he left and came down to Shanghai. And, of course, uh, we don't need to go into all the details there, but Brother Ni nee had, had left for some time. He had been out of the ministry, but through Brother Lee coming back, everything was restored in Shanghai. And uh, the church life was doing quite well until 1949. And then it was clear that the communists were going to take over the whole country. And uh, once it was clear the communists were going to take over the whole country, Brother Nee said clearly and strongly to Brother Lee, you have to leave. You have to leave this country. And Brother Nee said to the rest, he called an urgent conference of some of the co-workers, and uh, he told the rest of them, he said, all of the rest of us must stay. Only Brother Lee should go. But of course, not all of them did stay. But that was still Brother Nee's word. So, Brother Lee, he was really quite dumbfounded by this word. He wanted to stay also. He even asked Brother Nee, uh, aren't I worthy to suffer for the Lord like the rest? And Brother Nee shared with him, clearly, the Lord has shown us something. And if we all stay, it could be the communists will kill us all and it will all die here in China. You must go out. He said, take your choice, Hong Kong or Taiwan. You have to go to one of these two places. So after some prayer and consideration, Brother Lee decided to go to Taiwan. And this was in 1949. And as it worked out, he got the last plane that was leaving. The last plane that left Shanghai, he was on it. After that, the communists had the airport. And he is listed today. Brother Lee has a clipping showing he is listed with the communist government in China as an escaped criminal. His name is listed as an escaped criminal. <laughs> Praise the Lord, he escaped. 
the last plane going out. And so, I think we're all familiar. He went to Taiwan in 1949. And from there, there were about, he says, three to five hundred of the saints that had come from the mainland. Although they had thousands, about six hundred churches all over mainland China. Uh, Three to five hundred had gathered, had made it to Taiwan. So right away, they began to meet and to preach the gospel because the situation was quite crucial at that time. You know, because everyone thought that, uh, you know, if the communists take over the mainland China, then to take over Taiwan is just a small matter. That's just right off of their shore. Everyone thought Taiwan would be gone. Still there today. But at that time, right before Eisenhower was elected, you see... Uh, everyone thought, up until, I should say, Eisenhower was elected, from 49 to 52, once Eisenhower was elected in 1952, he told them, don't touch him. He said, if you touch him, we'll come. So that protected Taiwan. That was something really sovereign of the Lord. So from 49 to 52... It was a prevailing atmosphere to preach the gospel because they all didn't think they had any time before the communists would be coming and probably most of them would be killed. So uh, they preached the gospel. They had gospel marches and they preached all over Taiwan, especially the city of Taipei. And uh, they just increased in in very large amounts. They went from uh, that 500 to about 20,000 within three years' time. And then they continued, of course, to increase. But it was a a large increase. And the churches, of course, then began to be built up in Taiwan. And uh, Brother Lee, of course, went back to Hong Kong to meet Brother Ni in 1950. This is the last time Brother Lee saw Brother Nee. In 1950, they met in Hong Kong and were there together for a few months. Then, Brother Lee tried to persuade Brother Nee, don't go back. Come with me back to Taiwan. But he said, no, all the churches, all the saints need me. I must go back. And so he went back. And of course, just in two years later, 1952, Brother Nee was put into prison. And he stayed in prison until he died in prison 20 years later. He was in prison for 20 years. From 1952 until June of 1972, where he received the news of his death. So, that was the last time Brother Lee saw Brother Nee. Then, of course, uh, the Lord's move there in China... Well, I should say in Taiwan, the churches begin to grow also and to spread and to be built up. And then, you could say for another ten years quite well, or another nine years. And then it was in 1961 that Brother Lee came to this country. Actually, I have to go back. In 1958, he made a visit to this country. In 1958, he made a visit to this country going through... Uh, this country on his way to England. And at that time, he spoke at a place in Los Angeles called Westmoreland Chapel. And that's when John Ingalls heard him the first time. It was in Westmoreland Chapel in 1958 in Los Angeles. And, uh, of course, you've heard John share it. I'm sure, but I'll never forget just the one word. Brother Lee had known English all of his life, but he hadn't spoken it that much. He studied it, he could read it, but his speaking wasn't that clear. But the, the way he started his message in 1958, because this is what he was beginning to see at that time, he opened the message in this way by saying, Did you eat Jesus today? <laughs> In his broken English, that's how he began the message. And, of course, it shocked everyone. No one had ever heard such a term. 
But he began by saying, did you eat Jesus today? John said he could never forget that. <laughs> today, that's common to us. But you have to realize in 1958, in this country, no one had ever heard such a word about eating Jesus. And the Lord was showing Brother Lee at that time this very matter. So that's, he spoke on the tree of life and eating Jesus. And uh, then after visiting there, he went on to, you've heard him say, visit uh, Honor Oak in England. And he stayed there for quite some time. Of course, uh, I think you know, and probably we don't need to go into the detail of Austin Sparks, having visited Taiwan in, in 1956 and in 1957. And in 1956, everything was fine. In 1957, it wasn't so fine because he did not agree with the ground of the church. Anyway, Brother Lee was responding to his invitation to come to Honor Oak. And so he spoke in Honor Oak for a few weeks there. And his last message was on John and the message to the seven churches. And the main point in that message at Honor Oak that eventually we heard tore the whole thing down was that the ministry is for the church, Amen. not the church for the ministry. Amen. Showing that John, such a minister and such an apostle, was to the seven churches. Amen. The ministry is for the church, Amen. not the church. For the ministry, because if you're familiar with the way uh, Austin Sparks operated, it was to have ministry centers. Everything was for his ministry. So brotherly just gave that message from Revelation, of which he said, "It's clear all the ministry, especially the ministry, is for the church, Amen. not the church for the ministry. It's not that we have a church so we can minister." It's that there is the one ministry for the building up of the church. The ministry is for the church. Anyway, later on he heard that eventually that it was that word that caused the whole thing there to crumble. <laughs> he didn't intend that. But uh, if you know the history, there was some trouble caused by uh, Austin Sparks disagreeing with the ground. Anyway... That was in 1958. Then he came back in 1961 to the United States for the purpose of uh, some business matters and some other matters. And uh, it was while he was here in 61 up to around, uh, I believe, September, October of 1962. He was here for some time. He was just fixing to go back to Taiwan because they had a lot of uh, conferences scheduled. A big conference with 10,000 was scheduled. But I have to mention, of course, before this, in May of 1962, the church in Los Angeles took the ground and began to meet. Uh, they had had, of course, some fellowship with Brother Lee, and Brother Lee did not tell them anything. He just said, You pray. You pray. You just pray. Whatever you feel. Actually, in 58, they tried to do nothing. He said, no, don't do anything. And uh, I think in 60, they wanted to do something, and he discouraged it. But by 62, he didn't discourage, he didn't encourage. He just said, pray. So by May of 1962, the church in Los Angeles took the ground in Brother Samuel Chang's home. I believe there in Los Angeles. Well... They had uh, around 30 people, 28 of whom were Chinese. <laughs> and two, uh, they say, they generally call it two and a half Caucasians, because the half was the sister who eventually, although she stayed a long time, even into Eldon Hall, she left. Uh, the two were John Ingalls and Jim Risky. That was the two Caucasians that began to meet in 1962 of May. That's when they took the ground. But in uh, Brother Lee was going back to Taiwan. I mean, if they took the ground, that's up to them. But he was going back to Taiwan. He had no burden at all to come to this country. 
He had not had no consideration. He had no burden. He figured to let the, you know, let just let them take the books and let them do it, whatever. His burden right then was Taiwan, especially in China. They had no burden for this country. Anyway, but it was while he was in this country, at that time, there began to be some uh, things happen to cause some great pressure upon him. Some great pressure. Some real uh, situations that were happening. And through this pressure, of course, he went to the Lord. And he went to the Lord. And he went to the Lord. And the pressure did not let up. It increased and increased and increased. And he went to the Lord. Why, Lord? Why is this happening? Something like this. I don't, of course, have the exact words. I've heard things here and there. But there, I'm just trying to put it all together. Anyway, the decision was, though, eventually he realized the Lord wanted him to stay in this country. This, uh, the, and the pressure didn't stop. It's not that he said yes and the pressure stopped. That's our concept. No, the pressure continued, but he got clear what the Lord wanted. That was to stay in this country. So he called Brother Samuel Chang. I've heard this story many times. And uh, this was in the fall of 19... Maybe it might have been right at the 1st of December. I think it was, or the last of November of 1962. He called him in Los Angeles and uh, he said... Uh, Brother Chang, I'm coming to Los Angeles. Well, they'd heard he was leaving because a big conference was already being scheduled in Taiwan. And he said, you are. Oh, you're coming before you're going back to Taiwan. He said, no, I'm coming to Los Angeles to stay. He said, oh, you're going to stay two or three weeks. He said, no, I'm coming to Los Angeles to stay indefinitely. Well, they were all just shocked. And so Brother Lee came. He was in the States. He came to Los Angeles and in 1962 December they began to pray and they had the first conference in December of 1962 which in an old house in Los Angeles in front of about 70 people he released the messages of the all-inclusive Christ this was the real beginning of the ministry for the Lord's recovery in this country